Hello and welcome to Mindscapes, a series of conversations with men and women whose ideas, vision and philosophy define our contemporary world. My guest today is an example of how an individual can make a difference. She leads an international campaign which today has more than 1,100 associate organizations in more than 60 countries around the world. It's a campaign that opposes a weapon that leads to a loss of life for a major disablement every 22 minutes. She was awarded the Nobel Prize of Peace in 1997 for her campaign to ban landmines. I'm delighted to welcome Jody Williams. Nice to be here, thank you. Um, there are so many uh, weapons, you have nuclear weapons, you have landmines, and, and a whole range of uh, issues around disarmament. Why are landmines so important and significant? Why has that become a passion for you? Mm -hmm. Landmines are somewhat different from some conventional weapons. They share uh, characteristics of nuclear weapons, chemical weapons, biological weapons, in that they're indiscriminate. They cannot tell the difference between a soldier and a civilian. And unlike many other weapons, once the landmine is planted in the ground, it continues to take victims for decades after the end of war. It doesn't recognize peace. Um, a while back, I was in Egypt in El Alamein, big battlefield from World War II. Whole desert is off limits because of the mines and UXOs, unexploded munitions from 50 years ago. It's unconscionable. It made the weapon different. It made it vulnerable to international work to eradicate the weapon. As a part of sort of our uh, lesson 101 on this, uh, what is the status uh, of your, uh, your, 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 your efforts? Uh, there has been uh, an international treaty in Canada signed by about 120 odd countries. And uh, what has happened since? Well, just briefly in the 101, mm -hmm. we kind of blasted onto the scene, no pun intended with the blast, mm -hmm. in 1992 at the end of the year, six non-governmental organizations um, formally founded the ICBL, International Campaign to Ban Landmines. Within five years, we had galvanized public opinion, created a unique partnership with like-minded governments, um, the middle-sized powers, as they call themselves, and created, as you pointed out, the treaty which, for the first time in history, bans a conventional weapon, which has been in widespread use. We now have 139 nations which have signed the treaty. Of those 139, 112 have already ratified. It's very significant. So we see that the speed with which we change the world on this issue moving toward the treaty continues relatively unabated in the post-treaty period. So does that give it uh, a sanction of international law? Oh, it is. Um, with the 40th ratification on March 1st in 1999, it became international law. Mm -hmm. At some point, it will also shift to customary international law, which means that any nation in the world will have to abide by it. And we're obviously looking forward to that day. Mm -hmm. That means when the custom of paying attention to the law outweighs the violations to such a degree that it's accepted practice and therefore everyone must obey. Tell us about the, the consequences and the implications uh, of uh, not banning what mines. And it's obviously not uh, a campaign that looks at just banning the induction of new mines, uh, which, is, which is critical, but also doing something about the many mines that exist in, in Angola and in Cambodia and in, 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 in right. many countries which have seen war. Right. When we launched the campaign, our call was for a complete ban on the weapon, the use, production, trade, and stockpiling. But it was also a call for increased resources for removing the mines that are in the ground and for dealing with the mine victims. The weapon, as you pointed out in the introduction, takes a victim every 22 minutes. And that is a clear you know, statement of the horror of the weapon and that it can do it for decades after the end of a war. But its impact is much larger than that. It can place large tracts of land off limits for farming communities. It can also disrupt movement throughout a whole country. I mean, 50 percent of the national territory of Cambodia has mines in it. And people are, you know, until recently have not even been sure where in general terms they might be. It obviously can affect the movement of goods and services, people, rebuilding infrastructure. How can a country, you know, create peace if half of its territory has these weapons of war that will continue to disrupt 
civil society for decades. I mean, it's a really a horrific weapon. Yours has been an enormous uh, success uh, in, in, in the advocacy uh, of, 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 of your mission. Um, it inevitably involves figuring it out, figuring out what it is that those that resist uh, the, the change, uh, their argument is. What is the argument for landmines? Oh, we've never, <laughs> we, but that's easy. We've never disputed that there's some utility to the weapon. Obviously, I mean, anything, if, if you're a warrior, anything that can enhance your needs in battle is of use, some use. Thankfully, and somewhat bizarrely, there are laws of war that try to regulate the means and methods. You know, the common understanding is that even if you have to resort to war, you may not do anything you wish to win, right? You may not, the means and methods you choose for carrying out your battles should not so greatly prejudice civil society that the impact is greater than what you benefit from. Um, and, th and the problem of landmines is that while they might be useful in the two hours of battle or the two weeks of the battle or even, you know, two months of holding a town, the battles move on and the landmines stay. Mm -hmm. So then when communities come home, they find they can't live. And that, that makes them illegal under international law because they continue to kill and maim for, for ev essentially forever. Have you found that sort of countries which are ostensibly democratic tend to be more responsive uh, to, uh, to the issue because it tends to affect uh, uh, the common man, the, you know, the community in the long term rather more than it does the military establishment? Mm -hmm. Well, it's been an interesting mix of countries that have come on board. I mean, originally, the argument of the countries was the same for everybody. Mm -hmm. The legitimate needs of a country to define how it will defend its national security. Mm -hmm. You know, the argument that anybody involved in arms control hears. Mm -hmm. You know, the sovereign state has the right. Mm -hmm. And dictatorships and democracies say the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, we were able, however, through our efforts of educating civil society, through the hard facts that we have on the issue to get military to take a look at this one weapon. And we've been wildly successful. The entire Western Hemisphere, except the United States and its arch enemy Cuba, mm -hmm. have signed the treaty. Mm -hmm. All of NATO have signed the treaty except the United States and Turkey. Mm -hmm. And then we were recently very gratified to um, receive a statement from the foreign ministers of Greece and Turkey, you know, centuries old enemies, saying that together they were going to join this treaty as a confidence building measure, which will then put the United States um, in isolation in NATO. So we, we see, you know, that countries of all stripes, Cambodia, um, Thailand, 45 of the nations of Africa have signed, you know, with all different forms of government, recognizing that they can give up this weapon. I think it's quite a fantastic achievement. Tell us something about the, uh, the costs of, uh, of not intervening, of, of, of not eliminating the weapon uh, for a country, for a community. Uh, you know, we have figures, 25,000 people are killed or maimed every year, Five, 6,000 of them are children. These are global figures. Um, uh, apart from the, the moral imperative, which is, is, is obviously a very uh, strong and, and impressive one, uh, and I think that uh, the enormous achievement of, of your movement has been uh, that you have been able to, to catalyze uh, so many governments without going through traditional diplomatic channel or the t traditional fora of decision making and, and of, of evolving treaties. That's why we succeeded, quite <laughs> frankly. If we'd gone through tra traditional fora, we would not. We would not. But yes, the costs are great. They're, as, as we've been discussing, they're more than the individual victim. They can set back a poor country for decades and decades and decades. Not just that they can continue to kill for decades. In almost all instances, it's the poorest of the poor. Cambodia, Afghanistan, Angola, Mozambique, the countries with the least resources, the countries whose populations must rely on their bodies to provide you know, food every day for their families. These are the countries that are most hard hit by the weapon. I can't quite remember the figure in Cambodia. It's one out of every few hundred people is a mine victim. I mean, that's just, it's mind-boggling. 
A country that small, that poor cannot afford to have that loss of human resource and on top of it have to try to take care of the victims. It's hugely overwhelming. Let's look at this, 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 this sovereign nation argument. Oh. Uh, and, 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 and you know, you're, you're addressing, say, civil society in India. Um, the moral argument is a very strong imperative. This is the land of Gandhi. This is our commitment to nonviolence, to, to, to what have you. Um, what would we say uh, to, to civil society in India as, 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 as their responsibility, as, as their argument, their need, their imperatives uh, to act for the national good, shall I say? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Because um, people in this country are victims of landmines. In the recent border clash with Pakistan, um, there were some 800 some odd victims. Some, I think, 7,000 incidents. Indian peacekeepers can be harmed by landmines all over the world. I don't, um, and we in the campaign don't deny the right of, of people to security. We happen to believe that security is not best found through an arsenal of weapons that cost not just the landmines, but all weapons, billions of dollars, which could be better spent on the human security of a country's own people. You mentioned that uh, uh, one of the reasons uh, for the success uh, of your initiative um, uh, was that you didn't move through the, through the traditional channels. Um, what was the secret? Uh, of the success, that in, 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 in positive terms, uh, what were the strategies that you used that, that made this happen so quickly in six years? Many elements. Um, I think one was that it was the first concrete peace-oriented movement in the post-Cold War period. It was the first concrete new initiative after the horrific Gulf War, where in my country, the United States, the media cheered the flyers of the airplanes and the bombs. I mean, it was quite horrific. This was a concrete issue that people believed it was a doable, if you know the expression. Mm -hmm. It's a doable, it's small, it's a small weapon. The, the victims are obvious. Mm -hmm. If we come together to tackle this problem, we can probably do something to address the needs of these people. We had no, I mean, we called for grand things, we called for the treaty, mm -hmm. but we didn't have any expectation that within such a short time we would have it. Mm -hmm. Uh, we set about to do this thing because we believed it was the right thing to do and we believed we could make a difference. So we were on point, mm -hmm. we were clear about our goals, mm -hmm. we had facts because many of our non-governmental organizations in this coalition work in the field. They're the people taking the mines out of the ground, they're the people putting the limbs back on the victims, they're the people trying to rebuild societies littered with landmines, so we know of what we speak. Mm -hmm we were able to convince enough governments who wanted change in the post-Cold War period, enough governments who didn't want a bipolar world, who wanted their voice and the voice of civil society to have a new role in what we all hoped, but uh, I find that hope diminishing a tad, mm -hmm. that the world would be different. Mm -hmm. um, so we came together in a very unique partnership of government and civil society working to address a humanitarian crisis in a timely fashion not saying, oh yeah, let's negotiate for 10 years mm -hmm. and you know, figure out how everybody's comfortable. Mm -hmm. Our view was, if you don't want to be part of this negotiating process, just don't join. Mm -hmm. This isn't a negotiating process to find the lowest common denominator. Mm -hmm. This is a negotiating process to ban this weapon. Mm -hmm. And those of you who want to do that are most welcome. Those of you who don't, well, we'll get you sooner or later. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But it isn't about any one country having a veto power, which is what the UN process is. Mm -hmm. You know, when we talk about the great need of democracy in the world, and yet the forum that brings together all the countries of the world mm -hmm. allows any one country mm -hmm. to veto the majority feeling. I think this is a shocking contradiction. No one country, I don't care what it is, mm -hmm. the sole remaining superpower or a tiny country should have that right. How frustrating has it been for you that your own country has not been uh, on board? Do you, do, you have a, do you have a sense of identity that it's your country, you feel now a global citizen? Oh, well, I've, <laughs> I've long had uh, no problem with taking issue with the policies of my country. I came of age in uh, the period of the Vietnam War. I was at university from 68 to 72, kind of the height of uh, discussion, if you will, about Vietnam. 
I firmly embrace the uh, one of the slogans of the time. You know, pro protest against authority, question authority. You know, just because somebody has a title as a government person, that doesn't give them some sort of divinely inspired knowledge or correctness in their view. I think a, a true citizen of a country, a true patriot, does question. A true patriot does not say, oh, you know, my country right or wrong, and yes, those great men and women know more than I. Uh, you know, knowledge is not the purview of government officials. All one has to do is study the issues oneself and form an opinion and take action. I think in a democracy, it's, it's a responsibility. It's not just the rights that we get from a democracy. To make it a strong and viable democracy, one has the obligation to use one's education to help form the community one wants to see and have their government play the role in the world that they believe it should be playing. My government in the United States is supposed to express my view. It's my tax dollars that pay for the policies of my country. I most assuredly will speak my view to form a world that I believe in. And I don't care if my country doesn't like what I say. I don't care if any country in the world doesn't like what I say. I have every right as a citizen of the world to say my view. And I have a responsibility. It's so easy to sit back and complain and just say, oh, you know, this guy doesn't do that right. This government doesn't do that right. Oh, I'll just wait for the government to fix it. I'll wait. No, I'm not waiting for anyone. I have a view. I take action. I speak. Words are cheap. It's easy to talk. I talk. Mm -hmm. I like to talk, but I do more than that. I turn my words into action. Mm -hmm. So I feel like I have every moral authority to have my view expressed, and if it makes people unhappy, at least maybe it will make them think. Mm -hmm. There's nothing wrong with mm -hmm. thinking. <laughs> you know, you have said that uh, one of the sort of the motives, uh, one of the factors, personal factors for you was, uh, uh, you know, your brother was deaf and the manner in which he was treated in school. Uh, and, and you just didn't want to take bullies. Um, how does the sort of a, 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 a personal experience, a personal commitment, uh, translate into, uh, how do I put it, such sort of decisive, powerful uh, action? Uh, you know, many of us feel sometimes wronged, we feel frustrated. Uh, we sort of tend to feel that uh, social action of that kind uh, could, would, would, would require personal sacrifices would require being discriminated against by the systems of the state. Um, how have you resolved it? What was the impetus? Uh, you're exceptional. No, I don't think I'm <laughs> exceptional. I think I'm an ordinary person. I think that what distinguishes us in the landmine campaign is that we have done extraordinary work. Now, I don't I take issue with people that think titles are extraordinary and celebrity is extraordinary. It's the work you do that's important in my view. Uh, you know, since the prize, the Nobel Prize, people do ask the question, you know, what made you the way you are? Who knows? I mean, I can certainly define elements. My brother is an important one. The Vietnam War, coming of age in that period, is another. I also, at a very young age, for whatever reason, came to recognize that my ideas and my point of view are as important as anyone else's. I have the right to form them, I have the right to express them and act on them. And I was not going to be a ping pong ball trying to make myself into what made everyone else happy. No matter what you do, people are going to form an opinion about you. So why should you spend your time trying to you know, make yourself into what will make everybody happy? Because in this planet of how many billion people, you're going to have people who like you and hate you no matter what you do. So if you waste your time worrying about being well-loved instead of doing what you think is right, it's a waste of a life in my view. So for whatever reason, early on, I, I came to believe that I would do what I believed was right, respect other people doing what they think is right, and not worry about those who like me and don't. To what degree did you sort of formally um, formulate uh, a, a strategy and, and, and a plan. Uh, is it a, a naive assumption that if you have integrity, if you have passion, if you have belief uh, in the cause, uh, that, that, that you can sort of step forward and, and, and things happen and they unfold? How much of it is sort of consciously working towards a goal, using the internet as something that you did very effectively, strategizing? 
When first asked to start the landmine campaign in November of 91, an organization in the United States and one in Germany had been working together on prosthetic projects and saw very quickly that if you just keep putting the limbs on the victim, well, that's a good thing. But unless you go to the root of the problem, you'll never solve it. So they asked me if I would be interested in trying to form some sort of political campaign to deal with the eradication of the weapon. And uh, I said at that time that I would take a few months to talk to other organizations that had done some work on the issue, you know, organizations that had been um, recording the impact on society of the weapon, organizations like UNICEF who had been working in the field removing mines like Mines Advisory Group, to see if there would be a sort of a core that would take up the issue. Because I wasn't going to do, you know, a swimming against the tide effort as I had for, you know, 11 years in Central America trying to stop U.S. involvement in Nicaragua and El Salvador. I, I just didn't have the stamina for, I'm not a saint. I didn't have the stamina for more very, very difficult negative work. Um, I talked to people and they said that they thought it was a good idea. No other organization was prepared to take the lead because there are huge organizations dealing with many, many issues and just weren't prepared to spearhead a campaign. So I went back to the organization in the U.S. and said, sure, I'll try. And then the, the fellow said, well, how are you going to do it? And I said, well, don't worry about that. The <laughs> issue is we all agree that it needs to be done. I accept to make it happen and we'll move forward. Leadership isn't like saying, oh my God, this is the obstacle, and this is the obstacle, and this is the leadership, to, in my view, is you decide what you want to do, you accept you're going to do it, and then you figure out how to do it. So once we had that little part of the problem aside, yes, we did formulate a strategy. One of the key strengths of this campaign is every time we get together, we come out with an action plan. We never get together as, you know, the independent NGOs of the campaign or the different national campaigns and just sit there and congratulate ourselves about what we've accomplished. In fact, we rarely talk about that side. We talk about, okay, we have the treaty, we have this many, we, what are we going to do to get the remaining countries that have signed and not yet ratified to ratify? How are we going to do it? What are you going to do in your region of the world? When are you going to do it? How are you going to do it? And governments, with our remaining government partners, this is what we're doing in the campaign. What are you doing to bolster it? If I go to India and talk, what are you going to do? If I go to Pakistan, what are you Canadian colleagues going to do? So that there's always an idea, a plan formulated so that our campaigners can accept those elements that they want to work on, add new ones for their own national or cultural you know, elements that make them unique, but have an idea of how we're moving forward together. It's hard work to figure things out. So if you give people a plan, at least it gives them a framework and gives them you know, they don't waste time trying to figure it out. They can put all that energy into actually carrying out the actions. You mentioned that you, you, you weren't a saint. You no, I am not about, Mother Teresa. Are you willing to talk about sort of your unsaintliness? <laughs> what do you feel about some <laughs> oh, of your... Oh, funny. <laughs> it depends on which aspect of my unsaintliness you wish to discuss. The one that frustrates you the most. <laughs> oh, I've mellowed a bit with age. I'm 50. Um, when I was younger, I was um, extremely... Uh, I would get angry very, very easily. I still get angry. But sometimes my reaction to, uh, even within the campaign, in the early days of the campaign, um, if someone attempted to do, to, take, to formulate a plan that I thought was very counterproductive mm -hmm. to our, our goal, I was not always the most tolerant and polite in my confronting what I didn't think would work. Um, Unnecessarily so. Mm -hmm. As we would joke, I would uh, throw a tactical nuke instead of a hand grenade, you know? I'd mm -hmm. bring out the big guns, as they say, when it wasn't necessary. I think I've mellowed a little bit, but still, I have a lot to learn. Mm -hmm. There's been uh, an enormous success uh, for the campaign in maybe four, five, six years, maybe shorter. Uh, that, you know, there will be the international, there will be a treaty, and, 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 and in time, uh, it, it will have concluded, in a sense, <laughs> Uh, it has given you a tremendous experience in, in mobilizing opinion. What is, what is another agenda? Uh, do you think about another agenda after landmines um, or alongside it? I don't 
I don't tend to think that way. I mean, when I had done the 11 years of different kinds of activities mm -hmm. to stop U.S. involvement in Central America from 81 to 92, you know, during the Reagan-Bush period when mm -hmm. Ronald Reagan drew the line against communism in Central America and our hemisphere, I didn't think about what I'd do next. Even as I, the work for me there wound down after the peace came to the region, mm -hmm. not because we were so brilliant and achieved mm -hmm. real peace, but because the Cold War ended and the U.S. pulled out. It didn't care anymore. Um, as that happened, um, I was approached to take up the landmine issue. I didn't figure out, oh, this would be a great issue. Mm -hmm. And, and I, so I have no real idea next what I would do. I'm also committed to this through at least 2004. The Mine Ban Treaty requires governments to come together in 2004 and review the treaty. An honest assessment of where we're at, is it being complied with, et cetera, et cetera. How is, you know, what is the impact that this work has had on the problem of the world? It's not just words on paper. We believe in the treaty that if, I mean, in the campaign, if we don't maintain our focus, you know, governments will begin to shift right. their, as, as is understandable. There are tons of issues in the world to deal with. But we have made a commitment to eradicate this problem. We've made a commitment to determine and make sure that this treaty is complied with, that it's not just words on paper, that countries signed to look good internationally then don't obey and further undermine international law, which, as you know, is already a weak construct. So I'm personally extremely committed to making sure this is as strong a treaty as it can be that the model of civil society working with government in a new way, where we're actually at the negotiating table, is followed. Because governments want to say, oh gee, that was just specific to that one little peculiar landmine problem. We don't want civil society you know, with us in the negotiating room again. And of course they don't, because we make them do what they say they'll do. Mm -hmm. So the landmine issue for me is much more than landmines. Great. It's international law, it's the model, it's civil society. So I have a firm commitment to making sure what we've set out to do is pretty strong before I contemplate other things. Judy Williams, thank you very much. We thank shall you. be adding to the talks. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. That's been a great honor. Thank you.